Today, we're going to be talking about APIs, what an API is in general, what a web API is, and how do we use it? What is it for? And lastly, what is a REST API? How a REST API is organized? We're going to step into the shoes of a full stack dev who has to set up a website for a bookstore. And as our imaginary dev wants to do his job well, he's going to set up an API. So what is an API and why does our dev want to create one? An API stands for application programming interface. There are two parts to that application programming on one side and interface. First of all, what is an interface? Well, it's quite simple. The name says it all. The word interface is interface. It's something that's between two things that are facing each other. For example, the surface of the sea is the interface between the water and the air. Often when we talk about interface, we mean the thing on the screen that explains what the software is doing and allows the user to interact with it. In this case, the interface is the thing that connects the user and the software. That's why we talk about user interface or UI, which is the surface between the human and the software. In the case of the API, the two entities that are inter interact are pieces of code. We speak of a software library's API when we're referring to the list of public functions it provides. This includes their signature, that is to say the type of parameters that these functions accept and what they return. But most often today, when we talk about APIs, we mean communication via the internet, via the web. The web communication we're most familiar with occurs when a browser requests a web page to which the server sends about a load of HTML and CSS. Here in the case of the API, a piece of code, JavaScript for example, sends a request to the server and the server answers in a format that a computer can understand. Nowadays, we often prefer JSON since that is also readable by us humans. But at first, computers would respond in XML. That is the origin of the X letter of a technology that was once the rage but has now faded back into the woodwork, Ajax. But it's worth looking at why this technology was all the rage. And behind that is the question of what is the point of a web API? Well, actually, it's what makes Angular and Vue and React and everything called Web 2.0 work. In Web.1, the user requests the page, the server sends it back, the page reloads. In Web 2.0 in general, and in, for example, in React and Angular and Vue, we no longer need to refresh the page to access new information, to access a new state of our website, because the code downloaded to our browser calls the server by itself and updates the display without needing to change pages. For example, when you click the like button here down below, it doesn't interrupt the video. It updates the little counter by itself without reloading the page. You can try it out and see for yourself. As you can see, calling a web API allows for dynamic content without the painful experience of waiting for a page to load. So that's what web APIs are about. It's worth mentioning here that there are different web API formats. There's one default reference, one king of the pack, so to speak. The format that is used in most tutorials and many public APIs. It helps that it's easy to explain and understand. That format is REST. There's another more fashionable web API format created by Facebook called GraphQL. GraphQL has a radically different philosophy in how it operates but that deserves a separate video. For now though, let's take a look at the structure of REST APIs and how they are built. To start with, you should know that HTTP verbs have an associated meaning. When you open a web page, your browser actually makes a GET request. When you submit a form, your browser is actually sending a POST request or possibly a PUT request. And when you ask for something to be deleted, your browser might actually be sending a DELETE request. What are those meanings? Well, an HTTP GET request usually corresponds to a read request. A post is the creation of a resource. A put request is a modification of a current resource. And delete request is a resource deletion request. Now we've been talking about resources. What is a resource? Well, it's something that corresponds pretty much to a row in a table in a relational database. Let's rewind back to our bookstore website. I have books and authors in my database. Both of these are resource collections. And so I'm going to associate an entry point, an URL, with each of these resources. Let's say my API lives at slash API. So an entry point for my books will be slash API slash books. For authors, it will be slash API slash authors. And so I'm going to interact with these entry points depending on what I want to do. Let's start by reading data. So we'll be making get requests. For example, let's say I want to retrieve all the authors I have in my database. In this case, I'll make a get request to slash API slash authors. 
This is the simplest request. It, re it retrieves the whole collection. Now let's imagine that I know that the author I'm interested in, say Douglas Adams, has ID 42 in the database. To retrieve his information, I can do a get on slash API slash authors slash 42. This path with the ID added on identifies the author resource I'm interested in. We can even imagine wanting to retrieve specific information about an author, such as his name. In this case, we could send a get request on slash API slash authors slash 42 slash name that will retrieve the name. So here, Adams. If we wanted to go even further, we could even imagine wanting to retrieve the collection of books written by our author. In this case, for example, we could send a get request to slash API slash authors slash 42 slash books. Now, two small details here in passing to compare REST with GraphQL. The first is that accessing the books field of slash API slash author slash ID is one way of following the REST standard. But the API created might well have made different architectural choices. And that's true for other APIs too. APIs can be more or less RESTful. It's not just black and white. And so the only way to know what is implemented is to read the documentation, if there is one, or the code. GraphQL's advantage here is that it's self-documenting by nature. That's to say it's possible to send a request to a GraphQL API to retrieve the documentation. And that's cool. It allows us to do a lot of things. The other difference is that in REST, you can retrieve all the fields or just one. There's no in-between. If you want to retrieve three fields out of 50, you can't. And that's GraphQL's other advantage. It allows you to define the shape of the data you want to retrieve. But let's come back to our REST API. Let's imagine that we want to create a new book. All we have to do is send a post request with all the data filled in to the slash API slash books entry point. If we wanted to create an author, we would send the relevant request to slash API slash authors. Now, if we want to update our author, we send a put request to the path that belongs to the author. So with the ID at the end, with the new data. And we could imagine sending a put request to a single field of the resource. For example, slash API slash authors slash 42 slash date of birth. And of course, if we want to delete data, we send a delete request on the entry point that corresponds to what we want to delete. Now, of course, there's lots more to cover if we want it to be complete, such as the concepts of item potency and authentication, but that would be a way longer video. In the meantime, I hope this video has been useful to you. If you need any help, if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments.